to um, the inaugural Neurology Virtual 2020. Um, my name is Ken Ware and I'm the founder of Neurophysics Therapy and um, it is a great honour to be able to do to have the opening presentation here tonight. Oh, to, it's tonight for me, it's 10 o'clock at night. Um, identifying what the structure and time dependent dynamics of pathological tremors inform us of from a self-organising complex dynamical systems perspective within a neurophysics therapy setting. So. The life and times of pathological and non-pathological complex adaptive systems generated chaotic brain dynamics, commonly referred to as tremors. Can everybody see my presentation? Yes, here it's okay. Yep, you're, able, you're able to see the presentation, yep, great. Okay, so pathological tremors, of course, are studied quite extensively and for all the right reasons, they're quite um, detrimental to the health of a person and, and of course, the families and all that type of thing that suffer a lot from people who have these type of pathologies. And um, they're, you know, they've been studied at close range for their statist statistical significance and research into their biological and mechanical origins. I mean, of course, to develop medications and rightly so to help with the treatment of these particular disorders. However, stepping back and comparatively evaluating these dynamics through a self-organising dynamical systems and chaos theory lens opens up a broader avenues for understanding of the overall psychophysical state of systems exhibit pathological tremor when compared to the deterministic chaotic dynamics of healthy systems. And then with an enhanced and unbiased understanding of what the architecture of any variation of pathological tremor informs us of from a systems perspective, along with neurophysics therapy primary approach to treat the person and not the disorder, Neurophysics therapy has proven to be highly successful in the better management of and often alleviations of pathological tremor episodes. Um, so what is neurophysics therapy? Well, neurophysics per se is a branch of medical physics and stops dealing with the development and use of physical techniques to gain information about the nervous system, usually on a molecular scale, it's PET, PET scans and MR, functional MRIs and the likes, and neural networks and complexity science are just some of the tools utilized to make sense of the data and to develop theory. Neurophysics therapy per se has earned its own place within this branch of, of science, which I'm very chuffed about. And um, I develop unique techniques also to gain real time information about the functionality and behavior of the human nervous system in how it perceives and responds, basically interacts within the environment and through the expressions of well known aspects of network science and chaos theory and complexity developed a highly reliable method in neurophysics therapy to systematically perturb and alter the information processing architecture of the nervous system to enable more desirable patterns of behavior and functionality to emerge. So we've been quite successful at it and, and um, there's been several international and, and national media stories that have been told and played on about these outcomes of neurophysics therapy and the BBC and 60 Minutes and so forth. And a lot of this um, did relate to the work we've done and the successful work we've done with people with spinal cord injuries, um, which has been quite significant. So I'm gonna elaborate on those sort of things shortly. And all of this involved my understanding and um, certainly the exploitation of the underlying chaotic rhythms of the nervous system. And uh, we'll be getting to see a little bit of that as we proceed through this. But um, it's just that natural chaotic rhythms of the nervous system that given the right sets of conditions will emerge and um, informs us about the state of the system. And certainly given the right sets, those con right sets of initial conditions, it allows the system then to self-organize into higher states of complexity and certainly recover from a lot of lesion. Um, so a little bit of the background, it was the, the dynamics I was talking about. I, I first discovered them in myself back in 1982 when I was trying to become a Mr. Universe overnight and caused myself a lot of grief with lots of musculoskeletal type of problems. And when I decided to you know, sort my technique out and slow things down a little bit and had some lighter weights and going slow, I started to see this quite, quite significant tremor actually emerge within my system. And um, I just uh, naturally assumed then that this is the, what I've actually done to my system and the way that I've been training. And um, it was quite, quite intimidating to be honest. And um, as time, time went on, it became more and more chaotic. And I just thought, well, if this is the case, if I just let this tremor evolve, then I intuitively thought that somehow my system would correct itself and fix itself up. And, and of course, at that particular time, I became one of the very first people that thought of tremor as being something useful that was informative and um, certainly had the ability then to, to help the system to generate its, its, self, its self healing. So I studied this phenomenon, became quite fascinated by it and started to experiment with other people several years later. 
and um, under the same type of conditions by applying a mild stimulus to their self-initiated stimulus to themselves. And these were people who were suffering from long-term disorders, musculoskeletal mainly, um, that we've seen a similar thing emerge where the, the tremor would start to emerge and by coaching those people to just let it evolve. Um, but these people were also recovering quite significantly from some long-term ailments. And um, I became quite successful at that and found myself, I was invited there to take my whole operation into a private hospital in Mackay, North Queensland, where I was living. And um, we got to work with a lot of interesting patients in there because there was a psych unit in there as well. So and it didn't seem to matter what the what the disorder was, whether it was a mental disorder or a physical disorder as such. Um, the, the methods that I had developed and the techniques that I developed to expose these underlying states of the system, and then they would give rise then to more complex patterns of behavior and seeing disease and disorder, of course, as a loss of the system's complexity. So, I, you know, it's very interesting. And of course, um, we got to deal with lots and lots of patients, as I said, but I realized that there was going to have to be some scientific validation for what I was what I was doing and um, it was getting a bit of criticism from outside of the hospital in terms of that. And um, so I worked very hard trying to find it. There was nothing in neuroscience that could help explain the rapid transitions that were occurring. You know, plasticity was very popular, of course, but this went a little bit beyond that um, because we we're seeing quite significant recoveries in, in very short time scales. So I eventually started to, to look into chaos theory and I could start to see language in there that was helping to describe the phenomena that I was actually witnessing. Um, by 1998, I'd actually developed a complete model that would help explain it, um, but it took another 12 years before anybody really took any notice of me. And I, that's when I started to first speak at international science conferences. So it was a pretty hard struggle for many, many years. And, um, and then in 2013, along came John McLean, well renowned paraplegic John McLean. Um, so John had, as I said, he was a very famous um, paraplegic. He was um, the first person, the first paraplegic to swim the English Channel and to um, to complete Kona, the Wine Iron Man. He was recommended to come to me for pain therapy because he had some chronic pain. And um, as a result of that, I mean, I had never worked with a person with a spinal cord injury before, so everything was quite innocent. It was, certainly wasn't anything about walking at all on the table. Um, so when I first started to work with John and he enabled his system to let the natural chaotic rhythms emerge in his system and then evolved to the, to the level we started to see some you know incredible things happening in, in his legs that he was certainly unaware of so i'm going to show you that footage now and um, it's quite historic footage it's a quite a famous story this was one of the ones on 60 minutes so we'll have a look at those dynamics now i'll talk you through it so as you can see there um john's starting to just let that tremor evolve within his system and very shortly, you're going to start to see how that start to emerge below his legs. Now, John could not voluntary, he could have a little bit of voluntary movement over his right leg, but his left leg had absolutely nothing. Um, so you can see under these conditions that his legs were behaving quite bilaterally um, in sync with his upper body. And the term of access became more intense. And what's interesting here, when you see John finish this, is you'll see that his left leg flops back out to where it's, to the position that it would normally be and he has to actually bring that in by his hand. So under the conditions of learning, of letting go, you can see the look on John's face, he was quite taken back with this. Um, under those conditions in his innate nervous system was doing it, you could see these nice bilateral movements taking place. But when John came back online with his belief systems and all, the, all, the, all that he'd been conditioned to think about in the last 25 years, um, he just went back to that default thing. So. It was, um, we, we discussed it and I said, well, you know, somehow, John, your system must have learned to get it, must have been able to get around this lesion because those events cannot happen unless that has happened. And um, he asked me what that meant and I said, well, I really can't see why you're not walking. So that was a bit of a shock to me. He'd been in a wheelchair for 25 years and, um, and I said I was completely innocent of all this because he was the first person with a spinal cord injury that I'd worked with. So we had a quite a lot of discussion and then set about sort of make, trying to make that happen. So by getting into other movements that involve his legs, of course, and doing working through movements very slowly and coaching him along, eventually things started to trigger and eventually he started to be able to, to get voluntary control over some of those movements that we've seen, but in a more functional manner. And um, the incredible thing was that um, this man is an amazing athlete and three days later, he took his first unassisted
So it's quite amazing. John's, John has his book out, How Far Can You Go? That you can see on the right there. And, and as we speak, um, they're in the, in the throes of making a Hollywood movie based on this story. And um, the script has just been finalised, I was told yesterday. So um, 18 months later, John went on to complete an able-body triathlon. And it's quite an emotional moment as he crosses the line, the finish line there, holding his son Jack's hand and his wife Amanda. Um, so an incredible story. And... Um, Yes, and you know one of the other most one of the things that I guess neurophysics therapy is quite proud of is is with Kylie here, who um is a very graphic images there. Kylie had an aggressive sarcoma. They waited until it had a two liter blood supply until they actually thought it was suspicious, and that resulted in the removal of her complete sciatic nerve hamstring compartment, a three course inductive process, and so forth. And of course, all bets were on that Kylie would never be able to voluntarily um, bend her leg back. Um, certainly not walk properly or, and, and certainly enjoy the functionality that her leg had before. And as you can see some of the images over there, we can see Kylie doing those things. Now, I'm going to be showing you some footage of her actually performing those movements. But this involved, again, the her Kylie learning to let go and allow the tremor to emerge within her system under the control conditions. And by using bilateral input into her system, but taking through very slow movements over a period of time, within two months, Kylie was able to start to, her left hemisphere was informing, right hemisphere was informing her left hemisphere of what needed to happen and so forth until she eventually developed this um, bilateral stability within her system. So we'll have a look at that footage now. So it's quite incredible to actually see this person when, of course, most of you would certainly realise what the consequences would be for having your complete sciatic nerve removed and the hamstring and so forth and to see her generating these nicely stable movements so there's lots of um things and, and please don't take notice of this footage this um particular image here somehow that it's been reversed so it is her left leg not her right leg of course you can see lots of focus was required there but um but again it was the tremor activity that really generated a lot of these responses that enabled her to to start to use this utilize this leg so we can only assume that all of de-differentiation and differentiation occurred um, where that involved the agonist and antagonistic crossover to be able to generate these movements. So, So, yeah, so it's just important, and this that was a little bit of an extract from a, a movie that's just soon to be released, Calibrate, which is telling the story of lots of people who've come from all over the world for neurophysics therapy and telling their stories. Um, but I just wanted to impress the importance of understanding what tremor informs us of in, in regards to the general state of the central nervous system and how we've uniquely used this knowledge to exploit the underlying virtues of the central nervous system to optimise central nervous system functionality and performance and to whatever that means to any particular individual. So whether that's to bypass a complete or incomplete spinal cord injury, reverse dystrophic conditions, stabilise pathological tremors, rapid recovery of musculoskeletal trauma, or to even to en enhance athletic performance. When given the right sets of initial conditions, complex adaptive systems will naturally seek to increase in complexity relative to the system's innate relationship with its environment. As I stated before, disease, disorder, despair are viewed as a loss of the system's complexity. But this is a story about pathological tremor, so we'll we will need to get on to with that. So firstly, we acknowledge that the resting state of the healthy brain is chaotic, and we certainly don't um, feel we experience that throughout the, throughout the day because I can pick up my glass of coffee and not spill it all over the top of myself, but um, it's only because we have apparatus in the brain that help us to normalise our movements and to control the chaos. And it's not about eliminating, it's just there to control it. But if all of a sudden I, I tensed up my hand as I was drinking my glass of coffee, we're going to see another type of tremor reverse that relates to some overwhelmingness. So as regard as complex pathologies emerge when the brain becomes less chaotic and um, epileptic seizure is used as the model to demonstrate that, of course. Um, so it's well understood that that is the case. And um, so we see some work there from Lapamides and, and his colleagues back in the 90s that was done when these patients were in hospital and they had probes put into different locations of their brain. And we see the image on the left there, the different colours represent the different probes. And what they were trying to discover was areas where they could create a lesion and um, to inhibit the, trim, the actual um, seizures from happening. 
And what they noticed were about approximately 50 minutes before the seizure would occur, that all these areas would start to very much synchronize and then the system would have the seizure, would release that excess energy over willingness from itself and then renormalize itself again. So what we're really interested in is that um, is that pretty part down the bottom of the, the screen there, about the bottom of that, that, that represents that pathological state, that high order pathological state, because we're going to be referring to that a bit as we go through now. So what's super interesting about um, seizures are is that they very much follow the same um, power law distribution as what earthquakes do. And so this, the top section there, there's an uh, accumulation of a whole heap of data that's taken from 60 patients over time. And um, we see an earthquake activity there from one particular location in the planet with a lot of um, earthquake tremor activity in the earth. So they could see that even though, even through the, the spaces in between the, top, the intervals, between different tremor activity in the earth and um, the actual intervals between seizures, they see that even that seemed to line up. They're certainly not suggesting that earthquakes cause seizures, but the case is that there's this, it's like nature using the same rules over and over again. And on the right hand side there we have our own little experiments, a few lab notes we have here. This was just four channels that was taken from a patient um, that had pathological seizures and um, we can see that synchronization taking place very quickly and when we play music is one of the signatures of, of the epileptic brain is, is playing music how the brain will synchronize to that very quickly as opposed to a healthy brain and um, five days later through after neurophysics therapy where the person was himself being able to get rid of all that excess energy and overordinateness and to be able to prevent on the onset of seizures um, we start to see that all that desynchronization occurred and so he then had tools to use to to be in front of that process all the time <coughs> so oops, going back the wrong way sorry so, systems wide open or wave orderliness is the signature of pathological tremor and mostly most all other complex neurological pathologies and dystrophy so during an epileptic seizure, patient, patients visually, visually exhibit high intense, high frequency, low amplitude dynamics that mirror the state of their overordinately feed forward, uh, feed forward feedback um, central nervous system. And um, again, we're just referring to that bit of that time series when the pathological conditions emerge just before the seizure happens. Now we start to then, by scaling these overall dynamics down, we visually and electrophysically observe that overordinateness and hypervigilance of the central nervous system is a signature of patients presenting with a range of unilateral or bilateral pathological tremors. And that their awareness of their tremor increases anxiety in these patients, which creates a positive feedback loop that amplifies their tremor. And um, this concludes that there's an emotional or, or origin or a connection to the onset and the evolution of their rogue tremors. So the EMG, the data that we have at the bottom there, these EMGs that were put on the trapeze, the right and left trapeze, um, the top two channels, the middle two channels with the right and left abdominal wall and the right and left adductor process, the length of the inner thigh at the bottom there. So the allostatic overload and long-term overactivation of the sympathetic nervous system is another common signature of these patients and consequently they display hypersensitive and hypervigilant behavior which increases in value when hormetically perturbed. Their baseline background muscular tone of the trapeze, viscera and lower limbs in particular is significant. The acuity of sensory systems processing is naturally very noisy and compromised during these states. So again, we're looking at the role chaos plays in the maintenance of healthy psychophysical systems. And we see center stage there, some work from Ari Goldberger and colleagues back in the 90s, looking at the healthy heart dynamics over a 30 minute period. And um, you know, people have asked the question, which one is the healthy heart rate? There's very few people who actually pick B because they think that it's uh, something that looks chaotic and quite random, but that is the actual heart, healthy heart rate, where it's showing lots of variability and lots of fractal qualities as opposed to A, C and D, which are all pathological states. So again, we're looking at that time series where we see this, this high level of free, high frequency and very low amplitude and um, lots of periodicity in that as well. <clears throat> So the EMG that we've harvested from from different pair, the one we have on the top there, again, the right and left, uh, the right and left trapeze, the right and left abdominal wall, and the right and left adductor process. So the, the data at the top is from a healthy person. Um, so we see that's very similar to the dynamics of the healthy heart. 
where we see lots of variability. So when something happened at the area of the trapeze, it happens simultaneously right through all those other parts. So there's a nice flow of, of information through the system. Um, then we call that a pink noise signature. Then we looked at the, the typical white noise type of signature of the person with Harvard complex pathology, phys physiological pathologies, psychophysical pathologies, including tremor below. So that's a typical thing where lots of freak, high level of frequency and very low amplitude. So a little bit of reverse engineering. So most research is mechanistically dedicated to forensic investigation to determine who the main biological actors are responsible for the onset and evolution of pathological tremor and to the development of medications to ease symptoms. Whereas the orig origins of disease and disorder relates more to determining the sets of initial conditions that give rise to lesions within the central nervous system. And within a complex adaptive systems framework, lesion is the end result of the system's extreme sensitivity to initial conditions, both the system's initial conditions and then and the system's perception of initial environmental conditions. So tiny influences can have a major effect. And of course, that's the famous butterfly effect that I spoke about, which was just an analogy for that. Um, yet major perturbations can have very little effect. So there is enormous degrees of freedom for the system within this landscape. So if we wish to understand the behavior of the system and where things could have gone wrong, then we need to have some sets of rules and some stable sets of initial conditions to reliably measure the system's emergent behavior. So let's now look at some sets of initial conditions that the human system is extremely set, extremely and measurably sensitive to that could potentially generate rogue tremor dynamics. Now we all know why there would be a wobble on a wheel, correct? So the one thing that is totally constant and that is gravity within, so everything in the natural world has evolved a structure that optimizes performance and functionality that is responsive to and measured against the only constant there is and that is gravity. So our posture is like a rule and when we have that good posture where we're basically offsetting the effects of gravity on us. Um, however, if you look to the picture at the right there, that has the number 30 on there, the typical posture that person displays is very much similar to the posture that people with pathological tremors display. So they're in this forward type of position. It's like as if they're prepared, there's a line about to come in the room and they're just about prepared to, to do something about that. Um, so it's what we'd call a state of over-preparedness. Uh, so can we say that all people with poor posture will develop a pathological tremor? Well, no, we cannot. But what we can say from all our studies with and observations of the numerous patients who have treated, who presented with pathological tremors, um, can coinciding usually with other psychophysical conditions, is that each patient has maintained very long-term significant posture neglect. So for the human being, optimum psychophysical performance emerges from good posture. Anything less than good posture equates to drop off in, in physical, emotional performance and compromise their relationship and perception of the environment. So all animals have evolved a sensory motor apparatus to enable them to navigate through their environment in an optimal manner to enhance their survival and the survival of their species. And humans are more emotionally complex, of course, and emotional regions of, of, of the brain have a determining influence over the posture of a person at any point in time. And for example, a person suffering from depression will exhibit compromised posture during peak periods of depression. So using that as the rule, so we can sort of say, well, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Was it the, 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 the pathological tremor aspects of it that was causing the posture or vice versa? And as we jokingly say, the chicken is just the egg, egg's way of getting another egg, perhaps. So, however, as we said, the entire central nervous system evolved around that one constant in nature, and that is gravity. And the beautiful thing about having a reliable constant to measure performance of the system against is precisely that, its reliability and accuracy of data. It is expected that any particular signal to noise ratio measurement taken at times when a person is exhibiting optimum posture, that if they were to stray away from optimum posture, that there would be a measurable increase in noise that the system's evolved stabilizing features would need to criticize and compensate for. This would infer sudden hyperstimulation of basal ganglia, cerebellum, thalamus, etc., and no problem with short term, but what about long, long term, years and years of poor posture? In the case of Parkinson's, for example, is a, if the system is forced to continually compensate for posture neglect, is there mass long-term overstimulation to an overworked substantia nigra, the root cause of the disease where neurons die off from overstimulation, eventually passing that threshold where more than 70% of the neurons have died, and which time, at which time tremor and other pathologies emerge with, within dopamine-dependent structures, functions. So we have some nice data here. So we have this, the data on the top is from a healthy person 
And the perky periods that you see in there, that's when that person was in that, was at their constant, um, the vertical constant. So when we, what the idea was that we'd move them forward away from the vertical constant because it's that forwardness that we see in pathological tremor. So when we move the person away from it, we see in that typical time series you start to emerge that relates to that pathological things that we've seen in the epileptic seizures and so forth. Um, so then we, so this particular thing, we went from 150 to 210 seconds. We got rid of all the early stuff as we're sort of setting the experiment right. And um, then we played it again from 270 to 360 seconds. And we've seen that the, the, the perkiness became more animated. And um, of course, we started to see that, you know, the difference between that perkiness when they're at their, con their, their um, vertical constant as opposed to when they're moved away from it. Um, what was interesting about that was the, the right, right abdominal wall started to display a more permanent feature, which was corrected later on. But down the bottom there is a person with, with orthost orthostatic tremor patient. Um, so we did actually time this from zero to, to 100 for the first 100 seconds. And um, you've seen that typical time series. And, um, and as we, this, in this case, we were actually moving them towards the vertical constant. So, because they have, they naturally have that forward position. So as we move them towards the vertical constant, we started to see some perkiness appear in the data there. Um, but what's really interesting about this orthostatic tremor is that it seems to be this sweet spot when these people have this right, this tone at this right level of forwardness, that's when it, it hurts, the tremor of the hurts really increases. If they lean a little bit further forward, it tends to back off a little bit. So it's just this one particular state where it becomes very um, high frequency. So we persevered with that, and I think it was 190 to 250 seconds there. We started to see more perkiness in there as they got uh, more accustomed to moving towards that, that vertical constant. So that vertical constant is, is, is something that's very nice to measure to. Like I said, it's the only reliable constant that there is in nature. Um, the one thing that never changes, and that's that gravity. So um, it's just a very good um, thing to, to measure um, your systems against. So one of the things for sure is that all these data points, well, the point data points in these data signifies events occurring at all scales of the central nervous system and are sympathetic to discrete movement modulating structures in the brain and spinal cord. So what have we learned um, and acknowledged from our observations re regarding the state and typical profile of people with pathological tremor? Well, they have very long-term posture neglect as we want all and combined with long-term stress, usually business or work related. The biggest percentage of these patients were or are high achievers and accomplished in their field. Um, Long-term activation of sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight, that they've become accustomed to and perceive as their normal. The trapeze group of muscles, for instance, are very sensitive to hyperactivity of the central nervous system and will tense up. And these people have displayed very long-term tension within that trapeze area as for one. The normal arrangement being that the parasympathetic nervous system would kick in and return the system back to ideal allostasis. An allostatic overload is when, the, is when the parasympathetic nervous system is not able to kick in due to the person's ongoing perceptions and actions that keep the central uh, sympathetic nervous system hyperactive. Eventually, the parasympathetic nervous, nervous system has less and less ability to normalise the system. We have rogue sensory generalisation where they perceive non-noxious environmental stimuli as noxious. Um, and that is, they cannot place discriminated values on their environmental experiences. As a result, they overreact to mild somatic stimuli, even when given all the information about the nature and features of what the stimulus will be, and even when they are given the task of planning and initiating a mild stimulus to themselves. They are hypervigilant, exhibited in the excessive and unwarranted background tone of their lower limbs, spinal erectors and trapeze. This represents a huge and fatiguing energy cross throughout the day, leaving the system in short supply to maintain the regulation and upgrading all, all other bodily functions. <clears throat> noisy inputs and first noisy outputs. So all systems are governed by the same rules and the ongoing pursuits of pathological tremor is sensibly dependent upon some psychophysical sets of initial conditions. So positively and systematically altering some relative sets of psychophysical conditions will enable the system to naturally self-organize to give rise to new behaviors, that is a positively more softly central central nervous system. So as we said, treat the person, not the disorder, and mostly the emergence of pathological tremors is the end result of long-term posture neglect, allostatic overload, and hypervigilance. This needs to be detrained and patients have to learn to let go. 
If a person, for instance, was asked to tense up their body to the degree that most patients present in, they would also begin to tremble in no time at tremble in no time at all, due to the fact that they are inhibiting the release of excess energy from their systems. So as we said, noisy inputs in first noisy outputs, and this is a really simple rule, especially in consideration that the motor system is the slave to the sensory system. First we sense, then we respond. So we need to consider if we are looking at a sensory systems issue or a motor systems issue. If motor neurons are not being stimulated in an orderly fashion, they will deteriorate in some way over time. So if you were to hold a glass of water yourself excessively tight as you raise it to your mouth, your hand will tremble in a very similar manner to patients' hands that, that, um, with certain pathological tremors. Um, that is about four to seven hertz. And depending on the fir how, the, how firmly you squeeze the glass of water, the diameter of the glass, and how much water is in the glass. In this sense, it's always good to, a good idea to have a computational equivalent of what you are studying and or to find another example of the emergence of the phenomena you are studying in nature to compare and measure to and to make better decisions towards what the origins of your phenomena are most likely to be. Um, we say that treating symptoms can be a little bit like putting masking tape on a broken windscreen. Um, it is observed in these patients that increases in anxiety, increases levels of, of increases tremor intensity. This points to the amygdala's direct influence on the brain stems, the brain stem, the thalamus, motor cortex, basal ganglia, or the ventral amygdala fugal pathways. Um, neurophysics therapy then involves a self-controlled hormesis-like perturbation to the patient's central nervous system by the use of resistance equipment, which initially results in a high dimensional increase in the patient's symptoms, resulting from the in initial increase of arousal of the patient. The purposely prescribed perturbation is repeated and the patient is encouraged not to inhibit their tremor and instead allow it to increase in value. And this can be quite confrontational to the willing and trusting patient, of course. However, when the patient participates and cognitively learns to let go, and enable their tremor to evolve, we observe a desirable change in the structure and time-dependent dynamics of their tremor as this system disposes of its over-orderliness and self-organizes to higher states of complexity. And neurophysics therapy has been proven to be highly effective for patients who are prepared to render their own healing through this evolving process. So perception, action, and cognition, the main, you know, the, identifying the main pathological tremor-altering features of relative neurophysics therapy, the idea is to re-establish re -establish good postures. The person performs slow, light resistance movements while working through the stable grids that specialized exercise machines afford, lateralizing the hemispheres to perform the same task at the same time scale, re-centering re re the, the sensory experience. And there's only three perception, action, and cognition all taking place at the same time. Is it possible to even consider that a lasting positive change in behavior is likely to emerge? So we need qualitative, reliable measurements to verify holistic assemblies of neurons in a person's brain are firing differently to how they originally were at the beginning of the therapy to, to signify that a change in behaviour has actually happened. Um, a little note at the bottom there, if the tremor was in one hand and not the other, for instance, we need to go to the relative hemisphere and lateralise that hemisphere to the other hemisphere to correct hemisphere imbalances. A little bit like driving a car with a wheel unbalanced. So always treat the person, not their disorder. So correct sensory perceptual errors to elicit systems-wide improvements and focus on working through the grids to dispose of sensory perceptual noise. So I have a two-dimensional um, grid that's drawn over one of the machines that that person is doing. And um, in, a, in a safe supported environment, that person is using a very mild stimulus. They're bringing it across their body very slowly with their eyes closed. And this is when we see this hypervigilance start to emerge under, which is unjustified given the conditions that there are. And what the person learns to do then is to be able to, to detrain those responses and to be able to stay calm and composed as they go through it. During this phase, this is when the tremor is most likely to emerge, which we encourage to let go, get rid of some of the overordinateness, and progressively it restarts to, to return their system to a much more orderly state. So the unilateral features of the machines supply this st stable backdrop, which is a grid that enables us to observe, assess, and evaluate the psychophysical system against each point in space-time where every fluctuation matters. So a typical per perceptual error relating to a hemisphere dominance is perfectly dem is purposely demonstrated there, and there are the types of things that need to be corrected. So we have some compelling data here that um, example of systems wide up self-organization of the central nervous system of a pathological case resulting from four days of neurophysics therapy. So this time we actually had EEG, which is channel eight, and um, premotor and motor cortex, ECG, which is the channel seven there, 
um, the EMGs and the typical trapeze abdominals and adductor process. So we've got a very nice systems wide view of what was actually taking place. So we see them on the top section there that was day one at rest before neurophysics therapy, looking pretty scrambled, especially the EEG. There and there's heart dynamics with displaying some pretty unusual type dynamics with lots of arrhythmic events. And I must note that this all this data was harvested at 980 hertz, so very densely populated. You need to zoom in on that quite uh, quite a lot to be able to see the, the um, variability in the fractal aspects of it. And day four at rest post neurophysics therapy, we start to see nice neat lines of communication. And we see that there's been a significant rescue of those heart dynamics as well as um, some a more much more normalization of the um, of premotor and motor cortex. So this is another study we, we, that we actually performed, general mutual information analysis with central motor rhythms in a person suffering from uh, long-term from, from FSHD, form of muscular dystrophy before and after neurophysics therapy. So on the left there is the control, in the middle is the, is the patient of course, and then as, a, as after the four days of pre-neurophysics therapy and after four days of neurophysics therapy, we started to see a normalization occur within those data. And that coincided with lots of um, enhancements to that person's functionality that had been lost for quite some time. And it sort of begs the question, what were the genes doing at this point in time that are supposed to be responsible for this type of development, the on development of this disorder? Um, what were they doing when all these nice transitions were occurring? And that particular patient, there was 30 years of, of this disease involved and he's gone on to get back into business and do some amazing things. So neurophysics therapy has also assisted people with complex neurobiological diseases and disorders to restore lost functions in very small timescales. And almost everyone will know someone with one of the following conditions. So there's a whole heap of testimonial things that you can see on Vimeo. Um, if you want to take the time to actually get on that channel at some stage, um, so you can see all the different types of disorders there. We had stroke and Parkinson's, brain trauma, chronic epilepsy and, and the likes, um, and in particular spinal cord injury. And I um, just had a few little nice bit of images there of me working back in 1996 in the centre in the private hospital, just for a bit of historic value. So I'd like to very much um, sincerely thank the IMBC for hosting this webinar and for inviting me to present today. And of course, my sincere thanks to everyone who's persevered with me through my preservation, through, through my presentation, and my sincere thanks to the thousands of patients who trusted in my methods over the third last 30 years or so. And for all the many assistants and, and um, neurophysics therapy practitioners who've helped to evolve the international reputation of neurophysics therapy where it is today. So I wish everyone a really great um, the rest of the webinar and, um, and certainly all the very best with the presentation.